Please give an example of what a student would say to demonstrate the impact of a teacher's effectiveness. In this class, I know what I'm learning. I know where I'm gonna go next. I know what I don't know. I know where to go to get help. And I'm gonna do this together with you. And I know where I fit on the progression of the curriculum. And any, and many teachers in the room and many schools in this city have got five, six, seven, eight year olds in plus who can do that every day and do do it every day. The metadata shows what makes an impact and what doesn't, but some of the things that don't impact on the things that do. For example, class size affects a teacher's ability to provide feedback to individual kids. Could you comment? Class size drives me mad. <laughs> Come on, guys. I'm going to put a question back to you all. Why is the effect of class size so small? Now, remember what I've done. I've looked at what happens when teachers are actually in smaller classes, 15 to 20, compared to classes of 25 to 30. I've got a million plus in the sample. And the effect is small. Why is it so small? Teachers don't change how they teach. In smaller classes, teachers talk more. There is less feedback, there is less group work. Of course it makes sense that it should, but it hasn't. And unless you change how teachers teach, investing those billions of dollars recurrently is not gonna have an impact. Here's the problem, teachers. Over the last 200 years, you've worked out how to be successful in classes of 25 to 30. It's your fault that you're so successful. So yes, it makes sense if you say it should do, it's turned out it hasn't. Get over it. Next one. <laughs> How do we shift the prevailing assumption about education that the only worthwhile impact for students is that which will get them a job? Kids are not just preparing for life, they're living life. And if you want to look at our most successful students that go through our schools, that become our successful adults, they've learnt how to enjoy the love of learning. They've learnt how to become their own teachers. And you don't do that necessarily looking for a job. And okay, when I went through school, you did look for a job, which is why I did part of my apprenticeship as a painter and paper hanger. Those jobs aren't there anymore. There aren't any ladders to climb onto in many areas. Kids go through massive changes. The flexibility, the versatility, the strategic ability to survive in that world is dramatically different. People go into part-time jobs more and more often. They're shifting around. We can teach kids to be versatile. We can teach them to adapt. We can teach them to work with others. Those are the necessary skills to survive as an adult and a kid. If you can predict at age 10 what job a kid is going into, you're a better parent and teacher than I am. It just doesn't happen that way. Professor Hattie seemed to disregard the importance of curriculum. Is not the societal preference for subjects with strong economic drivers, engineering, science, accountancy, delivering narrower, less rounded people? What about history, philosophy, theology? Oh, look, I, for my sins, as I go around the world, I get invited onto an incredible number of curriculum committees. I have a simple rule. I will go on your committee only on the condition that you allow me to take half the stuff out. Wales, interestingly, is the only one I'm on at the moment because the minister assured me I'd be allowed to do that. Unfortunately, he's just gone, so I think I'll be off that committee soon. <laughs> Let's get real about curriculum, guys. It's adult groupthink. It's a group of adults sitting around deciding what kids should learn and they love to add stuff. If you put all the curricula across the Western world on a table, you would find very little commonality. You will find in America they do not teach statistics in high school. You'll find in New Zealand they don't teach finite maths. Both countries argued it's critical. Get over it. Get rid of half the stuff so the kids can be deep. Now, again, I do think there is precious knowledge. I do think that kids go to school to get the stuff they wouldn't get if they didn't go to school. I do think there are some of those subjects. I do think that literacy and numeracy is critical. But hey, particularly at high school, if a kid is interested in water polo, I will feed that interest by asking to do various subjects around that, such as the maths, such as the engineering, such as the crowd control, such as dealing with parents. There are multiple ways you can be excellent. And one of the nice things about NCA is it decided there wasn't a narrow canon of excellence. There was multiple ways to be excellent. I don't have any trouble. The problem I have in New Zealand with curriculum is so many schools offer a very narrow, constrained role of curriculum 
such that many kids who are bright can't succeed because they're not doing the right subjects. Yes, we've got to get it right, but it's not as complicated, it's not as extensive as it currently seems to be. I'm glad someone does care curricul about curriculum, I really do. I'm just glad it's not me. As we assess aspects of what works, I noted the dramatic decline in your presentation within mathematics results since 2009. What impact do you believe the change to focus more on strategies within mathematics over basic facts has had on our primary school children's learning? Well, firstly, the question is she wasn't listening. I said, get rid of the word what works. What works best? OK, next question. The decline in maths, like it's really interesting here, and I lived in New Zealand through those times, and I'm going to, I'm going to point the finger very clearly at the numeracy strategy. It was the biggest unexperimented lack of evidence implementation, which many teachers loved because they didn't need to know any maths, that someone crazily decided there were eight strategies kids should learn and there was an order in doing it. Where did that nonsense come from? It was rife through the system. It meant that those people who advocated were very clear because I was in the room with them. We don't care if kids don't know how, why, or sorry, we don't care that kids know that two and two plus four. We care they, why they do it. I do care they do to get it right. Now, I think you can trace that very clearly to a massively wrong implementation of a non-evidence-based religious system that has demonstrated its absolute failure. I'm glad it's gone. And this is the problem of a small country. When you get advocates who claim something, they have enormous influence, particularly when you get people out there who find it easier to do it that way. I think we can explain the maths very, very simply. I've made a lot of enemies in the room here saying that, but I think the evidence is very clear that by choosing the wrong way and demanding teachers teach in a particular way, we lost the impact on kids. Kaupapa Māori schools are highly successful for Māori kids. How do other schools collaborate with them? Yeah, I certainly got the evidence that they are very successful. Um, I'm nervous here because do they want other schools to collaborate with them? I found it very difficult. They are being they're very good at working with each other. They're very successful. Um, I would say the biggest problem in New Zealand isn't that question. The biggest problem is the incredible number of Maori kids in our regular schools that are not getting the kind of education. We aren't very good at teaching those kids, as, as we should be. And we've seen some of that evidence. Um, I would love to find ways to answer your question. I'm struggling. I'm not sure they really want you to. I think they would worry, rather worry about the issues they have. They're doing a great job. Part of me says, leave them alone to be successful and worry about how you can get either more of those kinds of schools or how we can get kids, Maori kids and regular schools to be as successful. Now you mentioned that we should be focusing on the impact of a teacher as opposed to looking at how a teacher is teaching. Yes. How do you measure impact? What does it mean to add at least a year's growth for a year's input? I'm going to refer a bit back to you guys. And certainly what I've found in numerous times is when teachers are prepared to grapple with that and say, this is what I mean by a year's growth. This is the evidence in light of the test scores. This is the evidence in light of the students' work. This is the evidence in light of what the students are saying. They do it. They do it stunningly. And we can judge whether that's good enough. And so I'm very careful not to be specific in answering that question. I want to hear what the teachers do. Teachers can do this. Some teachers say, I can't do this because it depends on the kid, it depends on the curriculum, it depends on the resources. Wow, do I know that if you have that deficit thinking, you'll be extremely successful at deficit thinking with your kids. <laughs> there are some stunning teachers out there right across this nation and Australia who can answer that question. And there is no one answer. But when you see that impact, it is pretty obvious. Deciding which teachers are effective and which are ineffective ultimately rests with the principal. How do you suggest principals first be challenged to make these calls and second be empowered to make staffing changes when they want to? Well, the principal has an incredible power. The biggest power the principal has is they can control the narrative of their school. And if they want their narrative of their school to be about impact, be about how we collaborate together, you get stunning results. Whereas if your principal wants the narrative about why the kids have come from poverty, why the system's not good enough, well, you get what you deserve, not much. Now, slightly question I'd, I'd comment on, on that last question is I'm not that interested in saying how do I judge whether you're a good teacher or you're a good teacher. I want to know how every adult in the school is working together and collectively looking at that. Because if you think of the hierarchy where we have some stunning teachers and we have some newer teachers, how do you work together to share that impact? 
The minute you make each individual responsible, you get the islands, you get the moats. I do want that clear. And I do think that there are some very impressive principals that are constantly asking this question. Yeah, it's not easy to dismiss teachers. It's not easy to do that. And I kind of understand why not. But even in t schools where you've got some of those teachers, you can make a difference. I remember something that John um, Hood told me once when we were talking about this. And I was saying, oh, I'm, getting, I'm doing okay, but you know, I've still got problems. I still can't get those teachers to move. He said, John, in business, if you have more than 20%, you have a monopoly and you'd be fined. Sometimes 20% is a critical mass to make a dramatic change in a school. Maybe you don't do it the whole 100%. But once you get 20% and grow that, that school can change the momentum amongst all those teachers. The worry with your question is so often we go back to the individual. How important is the school principal in the success of a top learning environment? What role do they have? I've never been into a good school that doesn't have a good principal. What is the most strategic place to start to introduce teacher standards in New Zealand education? Well, as I kind of hinted in my talk, I think that the, the, one of the biggest problem stages is teacher education. And certainly, as I'm doing in Australia, bringing in standards at that level and holding the institutions accountable that their graduates can change those learning lives of kids is more than a passion. I have to warn you, if I fail, I'll be looking for a job in New Zealand, they'll kick me out, but I'm passionate that that's the right answer. I do believe that, as we've done in Australia with four levels, that's enough. Um, how do we grow a profession? How do we move the salary structure from that to match the profession? And I think that's not a bad way of doing it. The difference between graduate and proficient? Eh. The difference between highly accomplished and lead? Eh. The difference between proficient and highly accomplished is critical. We've got to identify and esteem excellence. We've got to say to those teachers who have that passion to make the kids' lives, we value you. And we've got to do it dependably. Here's my problem. Too often, it's only done by principal attestation. And so often, principals see, because they're nice people, they see good in stuff that's not so successful. Too often, they judge it on the basis of how they teach and social interaction. You do need an independent part in there to do it along with the principal. Four levels, bring it on, Education Council. I want the same with principles. Education is so important, it requires the best of the best. Do you think there's any value in looking, uh, looking at facilitating an environment to make teaching as competitive as law? Well, that's what we've done in Melbourne. To get into law and education the same, we raised the standard a couple of years ago. The number of applicants went up dramatically. We test every student three hours online testing before they even come to us, and we don't take them if they don't meet certain benchmarks. A number of applications went up again. Um, let's get real, guys. If you put the message out there that if you're dumb, you can be a teacher, that's what you get. If you put the message out there you can be extremely successful, you will increase the number of the right people to come. If you want to fix your supply problem in New Zealand, increase the standards. Every other profession does it, why don't we? From your meta-analyses, can you comment on the impact of e-learning? Yeah, it's, there's been 150 meta-analyses looking at e-learning, and we've been doing those studies for 50 years. Remember what computers were like 50 years ago? <laughs> the effect size has not changed for 50 years. The only question in town is why has technology had such a low effect? I get sick and tired of people saying to me, oh, the answer's a new app, there's a whole new thing coming, there's a cloud and all that. It hasn't changed it. The answer's simple. For most teachers, they teach in a way they don't need technology. Here's my scare. The kids are miles ahead of us. They've learnt how to do it. The biggest impact we're having in technology is through social media. We're doing, in fact, Marie Davies here in Auckland. We're doing work at the moment trying to get kids in class to ask questions. How many questions does a kid, not a kid, how many questions does a class ask about their work per day? Not what page am I on, can I go to the toilet? What's the average number in a typical school here in New Zealand? Two. Now the teacher asks 300 a day. How do we increase student questions? We've used an incredible amount of social media where kids who are sitting in the class who don't know will get on their social app and they'll ask the question of each other that they wouldn't put their hands up to. There's the power of technology. 
it can make a difference, it needs to make a difference, or else the kids will get ahead of us. But so far, it's hardly made a difference. There are some stunning examples of exceptions, but in general, not much. Why are the NCEA results going up and the PISA results going down? The NCEA results going up, PISA going down. Well, firstly, yeah, the NCEA results, the way I've done the analysis, and I've certainly looked at it, overall, in general, it's a real increase. Yeah, there's some games being played, you know, asking kids to do easier subjects to get the right sub, etc. And of course we're good at playing games, we're humans. Overall, there is a, quite a dramatic change, I think, in the right direction. PISA is based on year 15 kids, and certainly when you look at the biggest effect is the kids in the top 40% are going back. In some ways in NCA, they do okay anyway. And that's kind of where I'm kind of hinting at today. We're doing okay, but we need to worry about level three. The drop there is too dramatic. The standards aren't high enough on that level. And maybe it's time to start having some targets about there. But let's, let me be fair. I don't want to completely put the responsibility on the secondary school. I think the whole sector at the moment is going in the wrong direction. And so it's very hard to ask secondary schools to fix problems that have started at age one, two, and three. I think in the whole sector, if we had a bigger focus, particularly on those Maori kids, Pacific kids above the average to increase what they can do, let's get real. Why do we send kids to school? It's not to meet their needs. What a low aspiration. It's not to help them reach their potential. Oh my goodness, some kids have very low expectations. Our job is to help kids raise above what they think they can do, to find something in them that they didn't think they have in themselves. Unfortunately, we've been feeding the lowest common denominator. But we can turn it around. Should we scrap national standards? I remember that fateful day when Mr Key announced national standards at Glenn Taylor, and he had a big speech where he told the whole audience about how when he met with me, I suggested this. And so you asked me to scrap what I suggested? <laughs> or claimed, he claimed I suggested? Look, I said before, the biggest problem in New Zealand is teachers don't have a common conception of progress. I look at the evidence in secondary schools with NCEA and what a stunning impact that's had in terms of teachers right across the country understanding what excellence achieved in merit is in a common way. The primary schools are struggling. Now my argument's the opposite. I think that um, yes, you could throw them under the carpet and pretend we don't have a problem. But it is showing very clearly seven years later that we still haven't got much better than random numbers. Now, it's the teachers making the moment-by-moment -moment decisions in the classroom that makes the difference to the lives of the kids. Not the test scores, their interpretations of it. And if their interpretations are so random, what's happening out there? Now, New Zealand has got stunning education solutions, often poorly implemented. It's a poorly implemented, it was, imp it was rushed through. It was put into place before resources were put into place. The pact came along too late. It was seen as a bit of a problem. Where is the resources to help teachers have this debate? Where is the resources? Take it off the class size and give them to have the time in schools to have these debates, to share, to question, to critic. If national standards aren't the answer, what is going to solve that problem? Getting rid of them and doing nothing will exacerbate it. In the 5,000 teacher study, what was the process that provided teachers with feedback about their impact? And can you give us an example? Yeah, sure. The teacher dials a local number, puts their phone away, instead of putting their headphones there, they put them there, they teach the class. At the other end of the phone, who cares where in the world they are, we have a professional captioner. In fact, we use TV companies who do the, you know, the, the, the subtitles. They listen in. Oh my goodness, these people are stunning. They listen in, they re-speak into their system. As they're re-speaking in, they code, according to the criteria we give them, teacher questions, teacher talk, kid questions, feedback, whatever, etc. And so they can then put back on the kid's laptop within three seconds everything the teacher says. They can give to the teacher at the end of the lesson the whole transcript and the learning analytics. It's relatively cheap, it's very scalable, and it's instant. Now, let me be, let me be honest, because I'll get into marital troubles yet. My wife is running it, not me. <laughs> so contact her, ask Kyle what his mother's email is, and hey, we are looking for partners in the research space. We're still researching on it, we're still getting there. But it's a re relatively cheap, very simple app. Um, it's free on iTunes. You can play with it. Is performance pay a way to drive improvement in teachers? 
I'm going to go out into the medical profession and say, I'm going to pay you, doctors, on the amount of people you keep alive. <laughs> Who would deal with the sick people? You show me any other profession that has performance pay like we talk about in education. I can't find one that's worked. But if you turn it on its head and ask what every other profession does, like lawyers, you get promoted on the basis of your expertise. Why don't we have a system, as, as I said New South Wales and South Australia are doing, where you have jobs with high salaries that you can't apply for unless you demonstrate that you're a highly accomplished teacher. That's how you give more pay. That's how you recognise expertise. Every other system has failed. Why? Because every other system defaults to experience. I think teacher pay, performance pay, is a critical problem to solve, but not the typical way we see it. How can non-educators make a contribution to education? <laughs> Philanthropists, retirees, and so on. The answer is helping us with the narrative. Trying to get away from philanthropists that we've got the perfect answer, we've got the perfect bullet. When you should be advertising, as I was saying to Andy tonight, you should be advertising the fact that you have the evidence of your impact. And then asking the question, as you know, Cognition's been doing for years, how do you then scale that up? Now, most people, particularly in the policy area, they now are so used to this notion of looking at evidence of impact. They don't want another person coming to them with a magic bullet. So I think philanthropy can play a huge part. As I said, I think it's been the biggest change I've seen in the last five years. I think that we have a massive job, educators, to educate our parents what learning is at our schools in the 21st century. It's quite different to what I had in the 1950s and 60s. I would, heaven help, I wouldn't want anyone to go back to some of those classrooms. And learning is quite different. And there's some very good examples of schools educating their parents about what learning looks like, coming and looking at the classroom, seeing what learning looks like. It's, we've moved away from the teacher standing up the front dictating and the kids writing it all down. It doesn't work that way. Help the parents understand what learning is. And hey, in, 18, in 1877, you passed an act saying schooling was compulsory on the premise that educators were better at doing it than the parents. Build the trust and trust the experts as long as they are prepared to say, we have evidence that we're experts. What is the meaning of the 30 million number you quoted when discussing five-year-old children's word recognition? The 30 million was a study where they looked at the number of words kids are exposed to, not the number of words they know, how many words have they heard by age five? And the gap between those from well-resourced and poorly resourced family is kids and the well-resourced families are exposed to 30 million words more. Now, my argument between zero and three and zero and five is the answer's simple. It's language, 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 language. And many kids in this town live in silent environments, go to play schools where there is very little language. There is no structured language. Now, do I want the parents to read to their kids? What a bonus that is, because reading spreads the language. Some parents who can't, don't, and won't read forget it isn't reading, it's language. And so that's the point I was making there, is how do we ensure, like here in New Zealand, at age, first, within six weeks of starting schools, kids used to have to do Murray Clay's concepts about print. The very first item is you give a kid a book upside down and the kid has to turn it round. In New Zealand, one in eight kids cannot do that and they all went to preschool. What on earth is going on in them? It is about concepts about print, it is about order, it is about language. So that's the point of the 30 million. When they start school at age five and you educators get them, sometimes it's too late. That's scary. What are three things parents should look for in a school or teacher for their kids? I was um, very impressed with a study on transitions that uh, Morris, Morris Galter did many years ago, and he showed that if a kid does not make a friend in the first month, it's pretty miserable out there. Now, friendship, I would argue schools have a big responsibility in the first month to make schools a welcoming place for kids to come to. We did a study here in uh, Auckland a few years ago where we put webcams in classrooms and asked the question, how many kids in a class on any one day does no one talk to? One in five. Schools can be very lonely places. And so trying, the first thing I'd worry about as a parent is friendship groups. Now I'm not talking about going to school with your friend. It's how you make friendships groups is very, very critical. 
The second is, listen to the narrative of the school. When you go around to the school, do they show you all the pretty pictures and the coral and this, or do they let the, talk to the kid and let the kid ask questions? Do they talk about the nature of the quality of their teaching? Now, I know when I did this a few years ago in New Zealand, I got into big troubles with a certain sector of the society that leave us alone, trust us. I'm sorry, you have the right to know these kind of things. Ask the kids in the school what's it like to be in the school. Kids are incredibly good consumers. That's what I'd be asking. You talked about lots of things that have a positive impact. Do you know where this is working well and how can we learn more? Where are the schools that are doing great stuff? Oh, wow. I'd love to do that. And, you know, um, as I do my work, I'm a little bit distant in some ways from some of the schools. My job is quality assurance of what happens. And I'd look to Terry over here because we have about 5,000 schools around the world. That's stunning stuff. I could name you schools in this town. Probably the most famous school in the world at the moment is Stonefields. It's probably not one country I go to where teachers don't say to me, what's happening at Stonefields? We can see the web. We can see the impact. There are many schools like that in New Zealand. So often, they're a little island. But how do you get those kind of schools? I'm shadowing, and yes, I'm biased. It happens to be my son. I'm shadowing him as he learns to work through open learning environments at Ormiston. I cannot believe the learning that's going on in those schools. I could go through right across this country and name you many, many schools. In fact, I'd even go stronger than that. When I do the analysis in this country, I'd probably say 60 to 70% of the schools, I could tell you are doing great stuff. And I've got some good evidence for that. It's an incredible number. And that's my worry. If we don't build that coalition of success, we're going to lose that. It's going to be too hard. We're going to get the wrong people and who don't have the passion, aren't prepared to do the commitment. Teaching's becoming a part-time profession. It's a bit of a worry because it's a long-term investment. I think there's stunning success, and that's my plea to you here in New Zealand. You've got success. Recognise it. Dependably recognise it. Esteem it. Smell the roses. Build the coalition around it. Or else you'll continue to lose it.